which I think we must move on now to our third speaker, Paul Bevan, who is going to talk about a totally different subject. Paul, over to you. Thank you very much, Paul. So today I'm going to be talking about, as, as it says here, the cloth banknote of the Sichuan Shanxi Soviet Government Workers and Farmers Bank. Now, I should say at this point that I'm not a numismatist. I am a historian in literature and art, as it says here, literature and culture. Um, and my contribution here is uh, what I talk about really at the end. Um, this banknote, which I'm going to be talking about, is, is quite well known. Um, we'll see how well known when it comes to uh, what, how I present it in a minute. Uh, this is actually in the British Museum and is one of several that are there. The Ashmolean also has a couple, although I haven't actually seen them, but I would like to at some point have a little look. Uh, let's see what happens. Uh, so this may be familiar to our Chinese guests, I don't know. Um, but I know that a few of you have heard me talk about this before, but uh, this is a slightly different angle. Okay, so I just want to remind you about textiles money on the silk road. We have Helen in the audience today and she's done some uh, uh, a lot of research on the use of textiles as money um, and, and published in um, the Journal Royal Asiatic Society, um, a special um, issue. So, you know, this is important, of course, the use of textiles as money historically. But it's not confined to China, of course. Uh, and I said, ju just um, introducing this, this is quite an interesting one because this is um, actually in, in Nigeria. Um, and we can see the main commodity of tooth trade was not ivory, but cloth. And uh, I, I think this is a, a particularly interesting article because it was written so long ago, basically at a time when uh, things were, will have not, you know, th by now things have changed quite a lot. Um, I don't think I will dwell too long on this, but I think it's interesting to see the uh, strip of only four to six inches wide, but uh, 50 or more yards long, which could be stored or transported as a long coiled belt, and it, it fulfills the requirements of what people, uh, how people um, define money or currency. So that, if anyone's particularly interested, they can have a look at that. And then we have it uh, slightly closer to home uh, in the form of Viking, um, use of cloth in Viking. Uh, and here we have an example of the type of loom that was made and a lady who is uh, reenacting uh, as a Viking. But we are looking at China. And so uh, firstly, we go back to the site of the first National Congress of the Communist Party of China in 1921. This is important because this is a, an, a obviously a one, one of the key moments in the history of um, what happened in the 20th century in China. We have, um, I don't know, whoever's been to Shanghai may well have been here. I've been here several times, a very interesting place it is too. Uh, this is a poster. From, the night, from 1973, showing visitors to the uh, site of the uh, first Congress. And just for um, context also, it, it, um, people will know that it was interrupted and had to be um, reconvened uh, in this boat, which was on South Lake. Um, that's not that relevant, I suppose, but it, what it, why it's relevant this, going back to 1921 for this note, is that we can see that this is part of red tourism now. So people go to this place, they go to the sites of uh, um, important dates on the, of the, from the uh, important sites of the communist, rev communist revolution. Um, and these objects, which I'm showing here, uh, are examples of red cultural relics. Not so much here because I mean these are are red cultural relics, but these are from the sort of 70s and even some of them from the 80s, I think. But here we have the typical uh, thing that a lot of people collect uh, around the world and particularly in China. But there are examples in the British Museum and in the Ashmolean Museum. 
and these are examples of red cultural relics. What we're looking at today is actually an example of a subsection of this, which is Red Army cultural relics. So these are things that actually took place in that that were um, used or appeared in in the history. So famous things. These these are the things that people carried as specific well-known figures in the period. Um, and what we're looking at is something to do with that. Okay. So we move a little bit forward to the death of Sun Yat-sen in 1925. The year before that, 1924, was the um, establishment of the first united front when the communists and the nationalists uh, decided to um, group together to, with the, uh, this is the idea of Sun Yat-sen, to defeat the warlords who were um, causing havoc around China in various, various areas. And when Sun Yat-sen died, the year following, in 1926, this is when the Northern Expedition took place, and the communists and nationalists went together on the Northern Expedition to defeat the warlords, pacify the land. When it reached Shanghai in April 1927, this of course will be quite old news to um, our Chinese guests and to some of our Chinese specialists here, but I think it's very important to establish this. Uh, this was the time of the Shanghai, Mass uh, Shanghai Massacre when the uh, nationalists turned against the communists with the help of um, various um, underworld gangs. And the communists were forced to go underground or to flee Shanghai and other cities at this time. And this is uh, one of the results of this was the Soviet Republic established in 1931, the Chinese Soviet Republic. And this is... Uh, a rare photograph of the uh, military parade. Okay, and now some of the figures we're, we're looking at here are, um, are important to this, and I want us to concentrate mainly on what they're wearing, actually. Um, we'll see why this, this becomes clear. Uh, we have Mao Zedong, Zhu De, Zhou Enlai, and Guo Gu uh, here in this photo. And this, Via this, we arrive at uh, what, what I'm talking about today, or the area, the uh, Sichuan Shanxi Soviet government, uh, which was formed um, partly with the uh, Fourth Front Army of the Chinese Workers and Peasants, Red Army, so the Red Army, in other words. Um, and they arrived in December 1931. The following year, the government was officially founded. And so this is, and this is the time of uh, the coins, uh, the, uh, the uh, money that we're talking about. They left, and we'll see in a minute, uh, they left, or were forced to leave um, as a result of the Long March. And here we have a, a uh, map. Now, famously, the most famous uh, part of the Long March was from Jiangxi, the Soviet uh, in, in Jiangxi, uh, all the way around here, and up to Yan'an in, in Shanxi, uh, but there were other um, Chinese Soviets. And these we, we, we see here, these are former ones that uh, had become defunct because people had left. But the one we're looking at really is actually this one here. So the Sichuan Shanxi Soviet. Okay, so money, uh, initially, the currency from other regions was used. They, they arrived in 1932. They just carried on using money that they had already. Um, e easier to do with um, silver coins, I think. Um, but subsequently, they actually issued and had a mint. Here we have it says here the, the mint of the of the region. Uh, subsequently, silver, copper, paper, and cloth money were issued. And these are all. We'll we'll get very used to these. Um, the way these this coin looks. Uh, Workers of the World Unite, the uh, the um, Soviet Republic of China, yeah, what well, a Soviet Republic, and this is the um, Shanxi and um, Sichuan Shanxi um, mint. Okay, so we've seen a, a silver coin. Now we see a. Uh, paper bank. What's important about this when we look at these is we're looking at the background. 
of, of these. We can see, I mean, obviously, the more complicated the, the pattern, the more difficult it is to forge. And this is, you know, I mean, clearly uh, an important thing for them to think about. What we see here is that the pattern in the background, but we also see uh, various forms of writing here, which will become clear in a minute uh, what they are. This is a, a one string of cash um, paper uh, note. And that's the reverse, can't see that very quickly, we'll move on. Okay, so the relevant paper to make these sort of notes was scarce, as was silver, and so uh, they decided to um, approach it for another angle. Now, I should say at this point, uh, well, we'll, we'll see in a minute, in fact, that the idea of a cloth banknote was not uh, a, a rare one. It's not only restricted in this area, but here they were, um, fortunate enough to have a lot of um, textile manufacturers close by. So textiles were produced in these, um, in these villages and these provided the textiles for the, for the notes. And we are now on to cloth money. Now, these I've put up because they are particularly, I, I, I would say that these are almost certainly fakes. You know, they are put on, I think they kept the, image comes from eBay or something and they're trying to, someone is trying to sell these as uh, um, original notes. They are not from our, our bank that we're looking at, but I think, you know, they, they do show that there are other examples. Here again, uh, other examples in different denominations that could or might or might not be uh, authentic. But this one, I think, shows some of the things we're going to be looking at again. As I said, you know, the hammer and sickle here, both here and here, uh, and the the way that a certain type, the type of writing used is is deliberately stylized. So this is a very styling stylized form of writing here, and that's what we'll find in a minute when we come to look at it. We see again the star, the hammer, and the uh, cogged wheel. We look at Mao Zedong, he's on his pony and they are going on the long march. This is between October 1934 and October 1935. And this, this is all subliminal. Um, I'm, I'm trying to put these I, I, ideas into your head without telling you why. So just remember you know, this, this photograph. And again, we have a, a similar one with Zhou Enlai and then Mao Zedong in the middle and Bob on the right. Again, I, I, I think, you know, Looking at their clothes is quite interesting in this in this case. Again, Mao Zedong in speech making mode and on the left. And we come back to another example from the British Museum. One of the, I think there are nine in the collection. I'm not quite sure if that's the right number, but quite a significant number because these are not necessarily very um, widespread. I mean, there aren't that many still in existence for obvious reasons, I think. Okay. Now, to illustrate some of the things I'm going to be talking about, I am referring to a program that uh, you might like to watch, which is called Woyo Chuanjia I have a family heirloom. And this is a special Long March episode. And uh, as, as I say here, it begins, and this is part of the, the film that is shown, it begins with a, a film from 1970, which uh, mentions the song of the three main rules of discipline and the eight points for attention. Now, this is another uh, important thing for us to remember, because this basically meant that the, uh, the ideas of this was, were partly that the the Red Army was not allowed to accept things um, from other people um, and always paid for what, what they received, uh, which was uh, meant to be very different from what the nationalists would do. Uh, they, the nationalists would take what they wanted, apparently. Okay. Yes, anyway, I, I, I'm having a bit of a problem here on my screen, all the, all the words are covered up. That doesn't actually matter. Yeah. Um, that is a, a little bit strange. Anyway, so this is um, a screen capture from that same um, program. 
remember it's called I have a family heirloom. Okay, and so we have the, the man, the uh, presenter comes on and talks about, we will now take a look at what these are. He reads from the cloth money and he talks about, uh, he, he, he looks at this, he tells us what it is, uh, Workers of the World Unite, uh, the Bank of the um, Soviet Republic, the Soviet Republic of um, Sichuan and Shenzhen. Uh, and then he leaves out the next line very deliberately. But um, it is spotted by this young lady here. And she, so he says, what is this? And she says, I think it's money. And he asks, why? Because there's gong nong yin ha, written on it, which means the bank of the of workers and farmers. And he, uh, this is what he deliberately left out so people didn't notice. But, uh, have you ever seen money made of cloth before? No. What is Chuan? I have never heard of it. I am not quite sure. Well, Bu Tai Xin Chu, she says. Okay, but luckily we have Mr. Liu who comes from Chong Lai and he is going to introduce, uh, he introduces, he is the guest, he's not the presenter, uh, what he calls which is cloth money. And there we are. So we will notice this gray and we will notice the blue. And that's why I wanted to, you to remember the picture because I, you know, we've seen already that the, um, the places where the cloth was made were the places where cloth, lo cloth was locally made were the places where the, um, the, the notes were printed. And in this case, we can assume that it's the same cloth. Um, and this, this needs further um, research. And of course, you know, I mean, I started this research not long before the uh, pandemic hit. So I, I won't be able to get to China, I think for a few months yet. So uh, the, the uh, research continues. Okay, so now we look at what's actually on the note. As I said before, this is Workers of the World Unite, uh, the Bank of the uh, Soviet, uh, 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 Sichuan and Shanxi Soviet, the uh, Bank of the um, Farmers, Workers and Farmers Bank, Hammer and Sickle, Five Points of Start and Clenched Fist. So these are all, uh, of course, the uh, symbols of worldwide communism. In addition, we have the three strings of cash here, San Juan and the date, which is 1933. So these are all things that people notice that when they first look at this, Chinese people will first notice these things and uh, they're not disguised in any way. But I come first to an, another television program, which I mean, it, you, could, you could translate it as the glorious process, but really, I mean, it's about the glorious history and the meaning of uh, the Communist Party, and it is in a program called um, uh, National Archives. Okay, so here we see, we actually see the, uh, the mold for the printing of the banknote that was actually found in the earth, in the area around where these were uh, originally made. And so they, they do a sort of reconstruction of it in, on the program, but this is the thing that they find, slightly repaired, here, as we see. And this is the location of that place where they were made, which is, as we can see, right in the middle of Shanxi and Sichuan provinces. So right, right in the middle here. And the place itself, which uh, is called the Mint. I mean, that, that's still, uh, oh, well, it's not actually called the Mint. It's called the, um, the Money Factory. So, uh, but, but still, there we are. And that, again, what a great thing it will be to go and visit, but um, it's not gonna be happening within the next few months. Uh, it is an uh, ambition of mine to be able to get there. Okay, and the, uh, this says the, uh, the um, site of the um, mint of the uh, Red Army, Red Army Mint. And the bank itself. Now, as I've said, as I've written here, the bank was originally founded February 1933 under the leadership of Zhang Yijai. Now, he is an interesting figure because he was in, in Shanghai and he was 
part of the um he was underground for a long long time in in um shanghai after the 1927 massacre and then he became the head of uh, the the bank um, at the same time in uh Kutsalva, a mint was established now we've already seen that was one of the places where the uh, the cloth was woven the lithographic bureau also um this place was known as the lithographic bureau because of the machines there, which numbered uh, five and had 16 people printing the notes. Now, uh, there are various stories about this. Again, you know, so we can see it's sort of half known, popularly known in China, in as much as it's on a very popular uh, television program, but it, it, it's not necessarily known as, as a, um, a topic of study. So this, this is a dramatic, uh, dra dramatized version of events as are supposed to have happened and this is a lady that we're talking about here who um, helped these members of the Red Army, um, fed them, let them stay at her house um, and then when they left they wanted to pay her but she didn't want to accept payment because as we have seen this is not allowed um, from the, for the Red Army but as they insisted because they couldn't use the notes anywhere else they left her these and so it so rather than spend them, she made them into a, uh, a sort of tunic which she could, she could wear uh, in secret and no one would find it. Because of course, if they were found by the Nationalist Army, it would be known that uh, she'd been harboring uh, members of the Red Army and she'd be in, in great trouble. So this is that she survived down to at uh, this time. I've got some more pictures of it here. A very interesting. Um, survivor. Okay, so these are the molds. We, we half saw one before, and we can see it doesn't need really much explanation. In, in, in a, in a, this one, not so clear because it was, it was damaged. So it's been re, um, remolded, re, uh, remade, or whatever, conserved, whatever we want to call it. Okay. So now we come to something that isn't so evident um, to people who read this, even if they are Chinese, because hidden behind, and this is uh, my interest in the bank movement, hidden in the background are uh, specific words that, that can be found. Increased production of the workers and the peasants, which is, can be seen down here, and develop the socialist econ economy, which is here. And these are in very stylized form, these, these words. And we can see how it had been printed. Obviously, this is incorrect. They have actually, um, they have actually uh, uh, made a mistake when they've been trying to mend it, because it should be um, the other way, of course. Okay. So here we have the two again. Now I just want to show how it should really be. Um, that is much more like it, except, well, yeah, I mean, that is actually how, how it should be, but uh, I, I don't know why it was presented like that on television, but uh, they just didn't notice. Okay, so back to these words that are, um, we can see in the background, and back to also the uh, paper note that I introduced earlier, and why I got that because on the right hand side you can see these same words or similar sorry similar words down here so they're almost the same uh they've just rather than shun shan we've got li at the end so um benefit or profit increased production of the so rather than increased production it's increased the profit or the uh, benefit of workers and peasants develop the socialist economy it's down the other side so it's not as if this was designed out of nowhere. You know, there are there are important um, crossovers with crossover with other examples of money from the time. But you know, these are clearly there. And I was talking about the patterns in the background. These are um, there for security purposes, uh, so that it's, it's much more difficult to uh, uh, reproduce them. I mean, the, the, I'm, I'm sure some of you will say that, oh, it's easy to reproduce anyway, but I mean, it's, it, it, it's less easy than, um, 
the ones that we saw earlier, which were made on someone's uh, kitchen table. Okay, and now we see for those who actually, yeah, sorry, I'm just moving. Yeah, so those who can actually read Chinese, I mean, it's not it's not even that clear there, but I, I'm sure uh, uh, some people will be able to uh, make this out. I have uh, put so these are the middle words are missing here, but or well, they're not missing; they're disguised, and uh, one assumes that um, people um, the the, um, the designer presumed that people knew what it might what, what it said. Uh, this is the first time we've seen ten uh, Chuan note i think uh, the three is certainly the most um, common but there are other denominations now so what sort of uh, printing presses these weren't the huge printing presses you would see in a newspaper office these are small portable printing presses which were in the mint that we saw in, in the uh, in the yeah the mint that we saw where there were five presses and um, a number of people working on them so this is the sort of thing I think that would have been there. This is, of course, where I, there's a lot of conjecture in this talk, I'm afraid. Um, but um, but here, well, that's just the way it is, I'm afraid. So, but I, so my belief is, as well as depicting these uh, Chinese characters at the back, they are also depicting machinery. And clearly, I mean, there are commonalities between what you can see here and, and next door. And this is uh, also the machine parts here of a printing press that can be seen again. Here's, here there's a hammer with, with the, somehow working with the conked wheel. And so, I mean, so why is that important? This is important because it's, it um, feeds into my idea that this is uh, inspired by Soviet Oh dear, sorry. By Soviet um, construct, uh, constructivism. And we will see a little bit later why this is. As in the art movement, constructivism. So it's inspired by certain uh, ways that the uh, Russian Soviets were, USSR artists there were um, producing designs and architecture and painting. Um, and in this case, clearly design is important. So another, you know, so we turn it over from what we've been looking at and we find exactly the same words in reverse and uh, what we in um, negative, which is quite an interesting thing because there has been uh, suggestions that the this has something to do with um, uh, seals, Chinese seals. Now, all right, so I'm going to look into this because I think it's quite interesting, but I'm not convinced that it is, is the case. I believe that these are examples of um, st stylized Chinese characters that had a uh, precedent in, in various design situations in, uh, in China at the time. One of these is, of course, the, uh, in the print culture that happened in Shanghai. This is um, an example of a magazine with the design by Zhang Guangyu. And we can see what I'm talking about here with a Shidai Manhua, um, a very stylized way of writing, which if we wanted to um, if we want to define it further, we could say that it is inspired by the, uh, the Art Deco movement uh, that was happening all over the world at this time. And of course, Shanghai is very well known for this. Another example of Zheng Guangyu's work, Wang Xiang here. And another from the uh, Wenhua. You can see very stylized characters again. So that's all very well. And that's, you know, that's partly where it comes from. This clearly is extremely stylized, the words Wenhua. But we are looking, uh, we move on to what I would term left wing design because it brings us closer to the cloth banknote we're actually looking at. 
because it's uh, within the same. I mean, what we've just looked at is not necessarily, it, it, it's not political. Uh, but, but if we look at the left wing design, then it is political. And here we see some examples by Chun Zhihuo um, of things that he was doing in 1931, just two years before the uh, design of that banknote. And we can see some of the ways, some of the styling, stylized characters and the design that is used on, the, uh, on this, um, for this magazine called Modern Student. Another example here of uh, some uh, stylized characters, uh, which I have given you examples of here. And yet more from the Kaiming Correspondence School. Kaiming was a um, important publish publisher of the time. And Chen Jun Tao, a very important um, designer, who was, uh, and the important thing about this, Chen Jun Tao was uh, involved in the uh, design of book covers and magazine covers, um, and was, uh, from that point of view, was known to have designed some uh, book covers for books by Lu Xun. And that, um, and other uh, left-wing writers of the time. So the impact of constructivist design in Shanghai, and that that we can see on th with things like this, the Trung Tam Yue from uh, 1928. Uh, we see a lot of the uh, the machinery that we, we will find in in Russian examples uh, or Soviet examples here, and and in the um, the lettering, Chuang Zhao, Yue Kang, yeah. Just to remind us what it looks like, because then we can see more clearly how important these, uh, these, this design aspect is. And here we come to where they, where they meet. Because this is um, a design on the right by Vladimir Krinsky uh, called A Revolutionary Structure. And it was published in a selective paintings from New Russia in this uh, uh, Morning Flowers in the Garden of Art, which is uh, a, a, a uh, periodical or a publication that Lucien was directly involved in. So this is, and he had a, a great interest in, in Russian art and literature. And so we can see Krinsky appearing in um, Chinese publications at the time. And we can see how that may have um, been inspirational for some um, artists who, who were involved in the production of this, um, this banknote. Remember that the man in charge of the bank was from Shanghai and had been, um, and then had been in the underground uh, communist Resistance. Okay, so in fact, this has happened two two years later than that. That uh, Krinsky's art had been in a, in a Chinese magazine, and we can see it in this in this magazine called Susian, which I've translated as thought, but my, you, it could be translated uh, uh, effectively as ideology, and probably better than thought. Um, but we find um, these examples of um, Krinsky again having so it's not a one-off although it is not I mean he's not a very famous artist in China at the time but it's not a one-off that he's using this so, so this is in 1928 and the other example I gave was from 1930. Um, but the important thing about this this, um, this the first edition of this uh, Sisyon uh, this uh, magazine is that it? This is the only time Krinsky appears in this. But uh, what is most important for us uh, understanding this idea of constructivism and its uh, a possible impact on some Chinese artists is that in the same issue there are works by this man called Wang Yiliu. Uh, to these are both the all of these rather uh, bad quality um, images come from the same issue of um, ideology. And so what I've tried to show 
apart from the fact that this is a, a very interesting banknote for every for, from various different angles for me the important thing is what is hidden in the background and what and the importance of the possible importance of constructivist design and art to uh, the design of that banknote and in fact that's where i finish so thank you thank you very much paul that's a very, very interesting and different um, approach to looking at money, I must say, from the uh, talk that we normally have. I found that <laughs> fascinating. Any questions, anyone? Joe, you've got a hand. Uh. That was excellent integration of numismatics and history and culture. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, found it Thank fascinating. You. It also made me think of um, what was happening you know, in terms of the art in Germany as well, the, the, the um, very strong use of woodcuts um, as, a, as a medium and um, the sort of the supremacy of black and white um, mm. in that context. Um, what, uh, as, uh, sort of looking at it from a numismatic perspective, one of the most curious things is the, the denomination um, mm. that it's valued in the three strings um, when cash coins had already stopped being produced yeah. and largely were dis had disappeared from use, that they're still using that as a denomination. Yes, I think it's only a denomination that is printed down. I don't think it's actually no. um, relevant well, to I, any I, strings. My, my suspicion is that it's sort of related to the previous copper coinages. Of the region rather than you know because in, in Sichuan there are still I think they were making copper coins denominated in cash even though they were um, clearly cents and two cent pieces um, but why three as well that That's, I'm not quite sure I think there's also a two exceptional yeah and there's the 10, of course but I mm -hmm. think there might be something in between I've yeah I'm, I've still a lot of research to do that 10 looked very fake, didn't it? Well, it, I, I'm not sure. Is that at the British Museum? Um, I don't think it is. I think, no, I think got, I'd, I've only I've, got three. So. I actually used that as in the illustration just because it was so easy to read. Compared to yeah. yeah. I think I just got that off the internet. No, but I, I thought what you had to say was excellent. And, uh, Thank you. I learned a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Peter, you've got a hand up. Would you like to ask a question? Yes, please. A uh, question for Paul, or um, actually it's more a comment than a question. Um, and I'm not even sure it's useful, but I leave that to Paul to decide, uh, which is that both in Tsarist Russia and in uh, the first years of uh, the communist regime, there was a de denomination of three kopecks and a denomination of three rubles. Okay, that's interesting. I'll look into that. Howard, do you, have you got a question? Yeah, I, I was. Uh, um, I was just looking at the um, uh, the Shanghai uh, catalogue, and there is a five that's uh, almost certainly genuine, and the two, and the most of them are three. Yes, uh, most of them are three. Yeah, that is but, uh, that is without doubt. Yeah, so that that's that's sort of having having a quick look at that. Um, but a, there there isn't a ten that's definitely that's right. Yeah, that's a no, ten. there's a ten that's a really tatty one that's uh, barely uh, legible. Barely legible. Yeah. Well, tatty is good. It's, yes, it's no, good. It's, it's, uh, the, I mean, if you, if you want to have a, uh, I mean, you know the um, uh, yeah that catalogue. Right, volume eleven, and, and, and there is the the ten is the right. Really oh, well, I'll, I have, I'll have a look out one. for that. But you should have, have a look at the catalogue. I don't think that's in Soas Library, is it? Uh, no, I think the BM's got BM's one. Got oh, right. I think. Yeah, should have. Uh, but yeah. anyway, that's interesting. Yeah. Thank you, Howard. Helen. Um, yes, Paul, thank you very much. We, I heard a, an earlier version of this a few years ago when we had a workshop and you've done a, a huge amount of work since, which is really interesting to see and to, to see how you pulled it all together. 
I wonder if you've come across any information or any kind of documentation of people actually using these notes. I mean, how many were there? Were they used? How were they used? And in which contexts? And if there if there were yeah. only the denomination of Sanchuan, it's curiously close to Shanxi and Sichuan, oh. and the Shan and the Chuan. Yes. So if there was only the, you know, if somebody's True. playing with those, I think it's a complete red herring, actually. But, but mm. the, is there something like that going on? Because there's obviously a lot of thinking going on behind of these behind these notes. Yeah. I mean, the only uh, the anecdote about the woman who was given these uh, notes for her kindness is the only thing I've ever heard about uh, in, in that context. But, uh, you know, and one of the big problems is, you know, there are a few, uh, few articles in Chinese that I've read, but they are mostly one copy, you know, one copy is the other, which copy is the other. So there's not, although there are a, quite a few um, essays, that is all the same information. So somehow I need to um, get there, I think, to uh, and get to some museums in China, possibly. And the other thing to do, of course, is to look at these a little bit closer, perhaps with a uh, cloth, perhaps with a cloth, uh, a textile conservator from a museum, maybe the Ashmolean, who knows, um, when, whenever uh, it's possible to do research again. I did actually want to go back to what Joe was saying, because in fact, yes, he, you're quite right that I think there's a lot to do with the, uh, the woodcut, uh, woodcuts from Germany and from, uh, and from Russia as well, but uh, because Lu Xun, who I, I mentioned a couple of times, was the uh, so-called father of the new woodcut movement, and so the woodcut was a very big thing in in China at this time, from the late 1920s, but particularly in the early 1930s, before Lucien died, uh, there was a, a huge interest. And right up until the present day, there's still a great interest in some of the um, germ people like Kate Kolwitz and Karl Meffert and um, other, other German um, woodcut artists. Right, well, thank you very much. I think we'll call it a day there. I'd just like to thank our three speakers for very different um, talks.